Good morning. Welcome to Sunday Science Q&A. And uh, I am already regretting having uh, a vegan bacon sandwich. So close to actually doing this, by the way. So I just want to, I, I had sesame seed bread. It could be an absolute uh, dental disaster. Anyway, that's nothing to do with you. Um, I've merely made it something to do with you. Uh, so we are back this week. I'm glad to say uh, Helen Chesky is kind of back, but kind of not back. But you'll find out more about that uh, shortly. But she is with us live. And uh, we are going to be talking, well, we're going to be talking about lots of different things, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Uh, first few little housekeeping bits and pieces, as usual. If you can support us via Patreon, that is fantastic. If you go to patreon.com slash cosmic shambles, uh, we're making loads of stuff at the moment uh, with there's uh, a new series called uh, A Book You Might Not Know. We've just started recording the next series of uh, An Uncanny Hour, which we're going to do about the films of Nicholas Rogue. Two films in particular, uh, Walk About and Don't Look Now, but also uh, a little bit about performance and a little bit then into the future. Uh, with uh, Man Who Fell to Earth, um, as well as obviously our tips for existence. And the latest one is with uh, Eddie Glaud, uh, who I did a book shambles with, and then we just wanted to put out the whole conversation, but also with clips of people like uh, Eddie himself and also um, James Baldwin. And uh, and that's then the next one we've got coming up is Carolyn Porco, who I'm sure many of you know. Uh, and uh, we talked about so many different things. Carolyn is fantastic. Uh, if you have uh, questions you'd like to ask uh, this morning, then you can just send them to at Cosmic Shambles on Twitter or you can pop them in the live chat and Trent will make sure that I get those. Uh, I also spent on, I'm back on tour at the moment with Brian Cox. We, we're not going to be doing the big tour this year now. That's been postponed, but I'm off uh, around the place um, doing warm up gigs with him and uh, beginning to understand black holes. Just beginning to understand black holes with him. Um, but also this week I went up to uh, Grantham and uh, and signed 2000 copies of uh, my new book, The Importance of Being Interested, which is out at the beginning of next month. And I'm doing uh, a tour of over 100 UK bookshops uh, starting on the 7th of October. So if you go to cosmicshambles.com and look at 100 bookshops, you'll find out where I'm going to be. But I'm going to be across the UK, not in, in Northern Ireland, uh, by the way, because I know some people have been asking about that, but I'm hoping to be out uh, in Northern Ireland and uh, also in the Republic uh, in, in January. So I haven't forgotten you. Um, and uh, But I'm going to be in Wales, loads of gigs in Wales, loads of gigs in the Southwest, loads of gigs in the North of England, quite a few in Scotland as well. Uh, so go and have a look at that. Um, next week is uh, a COVID panel. We haven't done one for a while, but obviously there's been a lot of uh, new information and new research and uh, going to be joined by two people who've joined us before. In fact, no, one of them has not joined us before. Uh, Christina, Professor Christina Pegel, who uh, is from the Independent Sage and Professor Sheena Cruikshank, uh, who has joined us quite a few times before. Um, and uh, we're going to meet our guests for today in a moment but first of Chesky, all where Helen are, Chesky, where are you what balcony are you on today before we get to my balcony i think we should explain your ghost because for anyone who's looking at this your oh i've got i've forgotten charles darwin's behind me today isn't he it, yeah but it looks white so the problem yeah, is that the yeah. way it's reflected in the ghost looks like there's a kind of white silhouette of Darwin. there's charles for you it's weird I, I put it up the other day because up the other day because i was doing a thing with an evolutionary biologist a, a kind of live q a thing and so i thought i've never put up my charles darwin but it means at the end of my bed there is a silhouetted hatted man which uh, if you're gonna be haunted by anyone be uh, haunted by charles darwin i think sometimes anyway. i can hear his son playing the you know instruments to the worms playing the bassoon to various different um so anyway, so I, I am not in the UK for the first time in a very, very, very long time. Uh, I'm in the Azores, which is uh, a set of islands off Portugal. I'm filming something for a French doc documentary, which means I've been diving on underwater volcanoes, um, and which I've never done. I've never seen bubbles released. These volcanoes are letting off gases underwater. And so it was an amazing dive the first day because you, you go down 25 metres and, you know, there's rocky surfaces and then there's bubbles rising escaping from the seabed so that those are volcanic gases and i was trying to collect them while a trigger fish tried to bite me anyway what, <laughs> there's all of that what i actually wanted to show you for my show and tell is this map here and what this is is the reason that we can talk which is this is a map of the submarine cables that run oh that's not uh submarine cables that run underneath the atlantic ocean um, and there's quite a lot. And the, the Azores is this little branch up there. 
that's the line that's coming to me. But we sort of forget that, you know, we assume that internet just crosses the world. And we forget that the only reason we, we are connected are that there are physical cables connecting these countries. And this all started with the Challenger expedition in the 1870s, who were surveying the undersea mountains and the undersea depths, looking for where they could put telegraph cables at the time. And the internet cables that we now have are the legacy of that uh, voyage and other voyages which were the, f the first attempts to connect. But, you know, we think of the internet as this kind of nebulous thing that just sort of works, but there are physical connections. There are bits of copper that carry these pieces of information. And there's quite a lot of them. So that's my show and tell. Um, yes. And, I, and the trigger fish did not successfully bite me. I feel I should add that. It had a very good go, <laughs> but it didn't succeed. I, I don't think I've, I, I don't really know what a trigger fish is. So, so give us some, some sense of, 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 of size. It's a, it's and... a, it's about this long. They're kind of pointed. They're sort of pointed at the front and then they're, they're quite slim. And normally uh, triggerfish, uh, they're the sort of colourful fish you might see on the reef. And they, they're just pottering about doing their own thing. These were in my face. I have never seen such aggressive fish. They were like in my mask. What are you doing here? And then they were trying to bite. Um, and I think, I guess if you live on an underwater volcano, so you live in a place of you know, sulfur coming out of the ground and lots of carbon dioxide. And you are, you know, they're basically the, this is an aggressive environment. And so the trigger fish, anything that is happy there is unlikely. But this whole underwater volcano was covered, it had so many fish. And it's because the deeper waters would come up um, from and underneath with lots of nutrients. So this, this, this volcano was quite a long way offshore. It was between two of the Azores islands, uh, but it was covered in fish. Because they were, and they were probably, it looked like they were having a bath. There were definitely fish because it was hot. You, if you put, if I put my hand near where the gases were coming out, it definitely felt hot. And you could see heat haze around the, um, around where the bubbles were because it was hot water. And they, th these fish were definitely having a bath. Some of them were definitely hanging about in the warm water. So I think for all the science about underwater volcanoes, what I actually discovered was a spa for fish. Brilliant. Lovely. Uh lovely uh and uh, we're also the first guest we're joined by today is professor alex antonelli science, director of at science Kew gardens, at and, Kew has gardens just and has finished, just finished uh, working on science strategy and manifesto for change and sustainability for the next decade at q good morning alex good morning how are you doing today good um just remind me by the way because i haven't been to q for a while what is that fantastic stinking lily that smells of human flesh for one day of the year that you have in there Quite a few species that flower like this. Uh, one of the most extraordinary ones are the is the tiny uh, the titum uh, arum, and that's the biggest flower. Um, and it's not every year the flower, but when you do that, it you know attracts loads of people because it produces a lot of heat, um, and you you feel the scent from 100 meters away, and it's it's absolutely impressive. I love that. I was reading a piece by Oliver Sacks, the Sacks, a uh, lovely book that he wrote, which is mixing the work of William James and Charles Darwin. And he he talks about and I, I just briefly because we've got Darwin. I had Darwin behind me a moment ago. He talks about that lovely idea that as he went round his garden when he was a little boy, he couldn't understand why magnolia plants always seem to have beetles running over them and why they were pollinating. Uh, and he said that his mother then explained, well, that's because magnolia plants, they evolved before bees evolved. So when you look inside a plant and you see the insects that are interacting with it, it gives you some sense of the time scale. And I imagine, you know, you watch that in queue all the time. To me, that's such a beautiful and simple thing that we can all do when we go out into the wild to get some sense of, of the timeline of the plants. Around. Yeah, I mean, I find it amazing as well. And you see, you know, cycads, for instance, and that's one of my favorite plants at Kew. We have a, an extraordinary um, example of the, the oldest living pot plant, and, and that's been pollinated by uh, small insects, which were around by the time of the, the, the dinosaurs were roaming about. And there were no flowers, so no, no bees. Uh, and we're seeing, seeing the same sort of pollination today. So it's just a record of history. Beautiful. Now, what's your show and tell for us this morning? All right. Um, yeah, so I've decided to bring a very remarkable seed. Um, which I'm holding here in my right hand. It's it's pretty small, so I can really close close my hand around it. And um, but it comes really from one of the largest and most long-lived trees in the Amazon rainforest. So it reaches about 50 meters the size of a 15-story building, um, and it can live for about 500 years, which is very unusual in the tropics. And the seed itself um, is very rich in calories, but it's really healthy. 
and it's got omega-6, selenium, and lots and lots of other micronutrients as well. So you know whether you guess what it is, um, it's a Brazil nut. And besides how gigantic those trees are, um, another thing that's really unusual about them uh, is their pollination, because the flowers need to be pollinated by the same bee species that pollinate, pollinate orchids. And in fact, the males of those bees, they're absolutely dependent on finding orchids uh, to collect the scent that attracts the female bees. So without that perfume on, they won't have a chance. Uh, but the females themselves, they are more interested in getting drunk on nectar and pollinating the trees. So they don't care about pollinating the orchids. So it's all mixed up, uh, which means that Brazil nut trees, uh, they can only grow in really nice old growth forests with lots of orchids around rather than in boring monocultures. And the local people really love them um, because they're a really good uh, source of income and they can do, they'll do whatever they can really to protect those forests. And a single tree, a single Brazil nut tree, they can produce up to a thousand fruits per season. So the people there, they just need to go around and pick them up uh, from the ground. Uh, but they have to watch out because the, the nuts, so the, the fruits where those kernels are, uh, they weigh more than a coconut. So they you know, have to watch out so they don't get one of their on their hands, on their heads. And it's a very sustainable crop. You know, as long as people leave some seeds on the ground to let them grow into new trees, um, they can keep doing that forever. So look, just to sum up, um, the Brazil nut and, and I, we share a lot in common. We're both Brazilians. I was born and raised in South America. Uh, we, all, we both like orchids uh, in a well-preserved rainforest. And we also like it when it's sustainable. So with all my respect and admiration, I'm going to eat one now. Mmm, yummy. <laughs> Excellent. We, we like our science edible. I like our science edible. And there is going to be a story about a question I've got for you, Helen, later on coming from one of our guests on that. Can I just well, you I just feel mentioned... very bad about like a candle at Christmas now. Anyone who was watching our Christmas Day show will remember me making Brazil nuts into candles. And I'm feeling quite bad. <laughs> about wasting them, <laughs> that, was, wasting them. that was the past, <laughs> Helen. And the great thing about the Internet is no one goes and dwells on the past and uses it in any way to turn people into monsters. So I wouldn't worry about your truly monstrous use of Brazil nuts. Um, I was trying to remember that Darwin, I, I, I briefly kind of referenced the formation of vegetable mould through the action of worms with observation on their habits. But Alex, there was another, uh, there was a Darwin book, which was something like the various contrivances of orchids. And I can't remember the rest of the title. It was another one with a fabulous title. Um, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> on my head but Darwin was a bloody good botanist and people don't recognize him for that he, he was really keen into plants and you know in his uh, little greenhouse he would cultivate plants and do all kinds of experiments he was the one who found that um, uh, drug like orchids they had this um, symbiosis with um, flies living in in, uh, in fungi so he was really good at examining uh, plants and really understanding how uh, the pollination worked out he was very interested in orchids uh, but people must remember him for his finches on, on Galapagos, and that's unfair. Yeah, it's it's a, it's an incredible collection of, of you know twenty nine books. I think he 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 wrote he he wrote in his lifetime on on so many different uh, subjects. Thank you, Alex. We're going to have some questions for you in a moment. We're also joined this morning by Professor Juliet Brody. Hello. Hi. Now, Hi. I should say you are Merit Researcher at the Natural History Museum, and uh, in London you are also now. Is it phycology? Yes, it is. Good. I yeah, wanted to perfect. double check. Phycology, yeah. which is specialising in seaweed. And uh, I'm also going to quickly, I'd like to know a little bit, I know you're doing a citizen science project as well, the big seaweed um, search, uh, which if anyone wants to find out more about that afterwards, just go to bigseaweedsearch.org. Uh, well, what we're trying to do is to get people involved in collecting information on um, some of our very common seaweeds and you know some of the sort of very large brown ones for example that we know are disappearing and also some of the uh, calcified seaweeds which we know are potentially going to be affected by ocean acidification and then we're also interested in all the non-natives all the alien species that are coming in so we ask people to go out and to record about a dozen different types of seaweeds send their data in and over time, we're hoping that we'll be able to sort of build up a picture of, of what's happening. And we've been running it for, we well, actually, I had the idea way back in 2006, and we've been running it now in its current form for about five years. And I've been analysing the, the data that we've got so far, and it, it's, it's very interesting. And I've been able to actually use some of the data in a red list that we're doing. But I think, you know, thinking of the 
the Darwin theme that's running through this program at the moment, and Darwin's ghost. And a quick aside, you know, last May I went into the museum. This was over a year ago during the lockdown. And there was only me in the museum practically and maybe one or two security guards. And I went down into the library and there's a there's a statue of Darwin and he sits in a chair and he's all white. And I'd gone to look for the tide tables. And, and you know, I really thought he was going to get up and walk about. And every time I go in there, he, he's like a sort of live person. And I tell you, the museum is extremely spooky. But anyway, yes, yeah, so we really want you to um, join in the big seaweed search and send us your data. And we're also trying to sort of develop more training programs. So if people want to become sort of long term volunteers, that would be great, too. And, and we'll be adding to that project. So thanks for mentioning that, Robin. Oh, it's wonderful. I think. Oh, it's wonderful. I think the citizen science projects that are going on, you know, both in, in, in astronomy, ge geology, biology, it's it's a great way of people to get a sense of, 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 of connection uh, with all of these things. Now, what is your show and tell today? Right. Well, my show and tell is um, a project that we're, we're doing in Europe and it's called BEEP and it's bionic materials for enhanced photosynthesis, which is a bit of a mouthful, but basically what we're doing is we're looking at structural colour in a whole range of organisms. And from my point of view, I'm looking at the seaweeds and we're just finding all these amazing new things. And the pictures I've got up there, the, the first one is the sparkling cartilage weed, which again is reminds me of the jewels that Helen was talking about. This is chondria scintillans. And it's another interesting species because we first discovered in, it in Britain uh, last year in the autumn. And that's the first record and it's expanding its range. And it's fascinating because it's an example of a species which is giving out structural color and these amazing colors that you see. And, and we, we found that the reds have two structures. They have iridescent bodies. And if you look at those cells, you see the colored cells like a little slipper or little oval cell. There's little tiny spots inside and they're about the size of bacteria about two microns across, and those we think are reflecting out the light, and that's what's giving us the colors. But we, but we, they move around in the cells as well, and we're trying to find out about those. But the reds also have a different structure, which are layers, and some of you may have seen chondrus crispus sparkling on the shore, very common on the shores. And then we know also that the browns only have iridescent bodies, and the browns are much more recent than the reds, and therefore, there's a there's an interesting evolutionary story to untangle in that. Did did they obtain these bodies from the reds, or is it an independent line of evolution? And then the greens, we knew a lot less about those. But I had a hunch for a long time that they would have structures. And I found very recently, you know, I just I just thought, oh, I'll go to the herbarium in the museum, which is a great resource. Chopped up some of these green seaweeds, and I found these structures, and they are very much like the ones on the land plants. So again, there are these very interesting evolutionary themes. And, and what's fascinating, and it links with this chondria perhaps expanding its range, is I mapped all the different groups of algae that I could find, the seaweeds, across, across geological time. And you see structural colour coming in all the way through when there's this peak in temperature. And it's absolutely fascinating to see. And, and you know, I'm sort of thinking, are we seeing more of it now as the temperatures get warmer? So that's my show and tell. And the second uh, picture that I've sent are just some of the spectral reflectances that we're developing with our colleagues in Cambridge, just to show you the sort of what these seaweeds are giving off. And, and, and you know, there's just so much to find out. It's, it's, it's so completely new for us. That's wonderful. That's and, and Oh, sorry, go on, Helen. Well, I was just going to say we should perhaps explain that structural colour. So we, we think of colour normally yeah. in terms of pigments. And actually, nature has two ways of making colour. And one is a chemical which absorbs some colours and, and reflects others. And, and that's kind of like the paints in your paint box would do that. But structural colour is when a surface has lots of, uh, as well as structures, they can be thin, like thin layers or, or small dots. Um, and, and what that does is it um, scatters different wavelengths of light differently. So the light that comes away, it hasn't been, it's not that anything's been taken away necessarily, it's just that the way it's interacted with the shape 
has produced a colour. And that's why it's, so I did not know till Julia said this, that, that there was structural colour in seaweeds. Yeah. Uh, most of the blues we see in nature are structural colour. So it's not, it's not common, but it's not uncommon. Um, but I had no idea seaweeds. Yeah. Were, so that's really cool. It's more widespread. And what we're really trying to find out too is why do they do it? You know, so, um, you know, our theory or, or my thinking is it's really to reflect out ultraviolet light. And you can sort of see perhaps, you know, around about 400 million years ago, something happened. And this is where you start to see it in these red seaweeds and you start to see different things happening. So they start to put their cell that's going to become the next generation deeper down in the surface. And then you start to see these, these structural colour. And that's when I think you have the rise of all those grazing animals. And maybe the seaweeds were pushed up into the shallower water, but you still get them in the deep water. So are they shifting light around? I don't know. There's many, many unanswered questions that we're trying to sort of work on and get some answers for. And I ho hopefully I think that will have answered to some extent. Hayley, who sent in a question, who sent in a question, Hayley, age 10. Hello, Hayley. Uh, can seaweed be multicoloured? I think you've given a lot of interesting there about the nature of colour. Um, so let's so I hope that's covered for you, Hayley. If you if you want, uh, if you'd like to add to that question, please do send us uh, something in the live queues. Uh, uh, now, uh, the first question for you, Alex, is uh, from Aaron, who would like to know, you never really hear about species of plant going extinct, but I assume this happens so can you tell us that? that's absolutely right um, and it's interesting because very few people talk about it um, you know I think if you ask someone on the street they will all know um, examples of animals that have gone extinct um, you mentioned the dodos and the mammoths. it's a beautiful hole in the natural history museum as well with all the extinct uh, animals uh, but very few people can actually name a plant that has gone extinct and and that's despite the fact that my colleagues at Kew um, They've identified over 600 plant species that have completely disappeared uh, from the wild in recent centuries. And that's that's more than twice the number of birds, mammals and females combined. Um, so um, there are some very good examples. Um, uh, for instance, the Chilean uh, sandalwood uh, that, grow, that grew on the Juan Fernandez Islands between Chile and Eastern Ireland. Um, so that had been exploited for the sandalwood um, for a long time. And then the last tree was, um, I think, in the beginning of the um, 20th century, was photographed by a Swedish botanist called Scottsberg, and um, it hasn't been seen since then. And um, we know now that um, the extinction of plants is actually happening about 500 times faster than the natural rates of extinction. And um, I really think it's a it's an underestimate because um, you know it's really hard to prove something is not there. Um, so absence of evidence is not evidence of the absence. And, um, and many species, uh, especially plants, they occur in very, very small areas, um, like in tropical rainforests. And we, we know how it's going in, in the Amazon and Southeast Asia and other areas as well. So it's probably many more species that actually have gone extinct, uh, but we, we don't know yet. That's good. Thank you very much for that, Alex. Uh, now, uh, our first, uh, now, uh, our first uh, seaweed, kelp and algae question from Trial Rider. And uh, it is, is there an actual difference between seaweed, kelp and algae or is it just different names for the same thing? This is a really, really good question. And it's all about what we call things. And it is important in a way that we make sure we know what we're talking about. So let's just take the word algae. This is a kind of catch all name that we use. And, and the algae are everything that's photosynthesis is not your land plants. And they're right through the tree of life. There's so many different forms, hundreds of thousands of different species, many unicellular species, and many, many fascinating things, species which also, you know, they, they take in um, algal cells, so they look green and, and they, they, they do all sorts of amazing things. So algae is just a catch-all term. If we think then about seaweeds, what do we mean by seaweeds? Well, we tend to think of these as the macro algae, those we can see. Although having said that, some of our macro algae are actually micro algae, but you know, you've got to keep your numbers up. And so you've got, you've got red algae and you've got green algae, and they date back to about 1.6 billion years. And they're in the same group as the land plants. So they're ancient. And, you know, you know, take dinosaurs, they, they way out surpass the dinosaurs, you know, they, they, they're still going strong. But then you have the brown algae, which includes the kelps and the brown algae are in a completely different group. They're in a group called the chromalveolates or stramina piles, the whole sort of range of things. Some of you may know the little unicellular diatoms that you see if you look on a microscope, there are lots of them on the seaweeds. 
And um, so the brown algae are different. They have different pigments. Um, but it's it's all this very, very interesting evolutionary story that I was talking about with the, with the structural color as well. And so the kelps are brown algae. They developed much more recently, only about 20 million years ago. And you'll be familiar with kelps because these are our kelp forests that we see off the coast. You get these all around the world in, in temperate regions. And, you know, here in Britain, they might be a couple of meters high. But if you go down to, say, California or to the South Atlantic, they'll be up to 50, 60 meters high. And if you know the Natural History Museum in London, they're about the height of the Natural History Museum. And of course, these kelps are in trouble, as you know, and we're they're incredibly important habitat formers. And we're starting to lose them. We've, we think 38 percent of them around the world may be lost or being lost due to climate change. And, you, you know, things are changing very fast. But the, but the kelps are a very distinctive type of, of brown alga. So I hope that I hope that sort of gives you an idea, gives you an idea. I've got Thank a follow-up question to you. So, you know, off the coast here, it's very obvious. So this is a volcanic island, so there's yeah. rocks. And it's very obvious that there are no kelps, that there's there's no there's no the big fronty thing. And I thought that was probably because they're cold water, they, they're more comfortable in cold water. Is that right? Because I was it mm. looks, you know, if I was off England, I would expect to see kelp everywhere. And it's really yeah. noticeable that there's no there's yeah. nothing that looks like seaweed. Yeah, that that's right. I mean, they are really sort of more the more the cool temperate. Although what's really interesting is that in some of the warmer areas, you get these kelp forests in the deeper water, where I guess it's a bit cooler. But you don't get them down in the Azores because you get more of these sort of coralline turfs and things like that, and these these different sorts of fleshy algae and things like that. So a little bit too too you know it's probably a bit too warm, I think. Um, so yeah, you know they, they you're absolutely right. So you know very very abundant here in the northeast Atlantic. Britain is very much what we call a Goldilocks zone for kelp, and particularly in Scotland places like that. You know, it's just right, really. Although, as I say, we are starting to see um, changes down in the southwest of, of England, particularly. And what's happening is we have another species of kelp that's sort of moving up again, like I was talking about the, the sparkling cartilage weed. Things, things are sort of expanding their ranges, but other things are moving north. So, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um Alex, question for you. This is a question for you. This is a, it's a very big question, really, from uh, Jack, which is uh, Jack would like to know uh, about how do we uh, or how can we learn from isolated tribes in the Amazon and use their knowledge to help protect the rainforest without interfering? Is this even possible? Um, that is a very good question. You know, the example I had with the Brazil nut, and I don't have it anymore. I just set it up. But basically, that's one example of a crop which can be sustainably um, you know, harvested without damaging the forest. And um, if you think about uh, some of the other crops in the Amazon rainforest or other tropical areas, like soybeans or um, oil palms, it's almost impossible to do anything that um, will be good both for, for nature and for, for production. We know um, that people have been, um, wouldn't say messing around, but they have been sustainably using uh, plants in the Amazon for hundreds and hundreds of years and you know at least a, a few thousand years um, since they arrived there and they have been uh, giving good uh, conditions for uh, edible plants to grow and uh, taking some of the plants from uh, South America for instance all the way up to Central America and that has been very sustainable because it is about uh, growing plants or moving seeds around which would uh, provide food to the local communities without having to cut down the forest so it's about finding the right crops for the right place. And um, in particular, you know, some of the things we consume a lot today, like uh, cacao and, and coffee beans, for instance, they can be grown in the understory of forests. And that's exactly the same technique as indigenous communities in South America and other parts of the world have been using. So they keep the forest, they, they still have the, you know, all the shade. Um, it's, um, it's very good for um, mitigating against climate change because it reduces temperature. It provides people with clean water, clean air, and all those series of benefits, um, you know, food sources, source of medicine, and at the same time, food. So it's about understanding what are the, the best plans for that. And unfortunately, we've been relying um, over the last 50 or 100 years uh, on 
an increasing fewer uh, number of plants uh, of crops and cultivating those large monocultures, which absolutely destroy uh, the local, local biodiversity. And so I think we have a lot to learn. Uh, there are some good opportunities, but some things we just ha have to let go. You know, we don't really need the vast amounts of um, um, palm oil and, um, and soybeans that we're using today. Uh, there are things to replace them. If we, the, uh, the legumes, like the different beans um, and peas, we can get the proteins directly from them rather than, you know, growing soybeans to, to meet the beef that we, we then consume. So it's, it's, it's about using things in nature and they can teach us a lot uh, about that. Thank you, Alex. Helen, you, you covered some of this, didn't you, on, on the climate panel you did at the Latitude Festival, which uh, people can catch up with at, at Cosmic Shambles as well. Did, didn't you cover some of this as well, this as well, the balance between local economies and, uh, and rainforest protection? Yeah, and I, I think it's just really important. I mean, the point is the whole planet is connected, like a whole, it's one whole system. And it, I mean, the, Alex's example of the Brazil nuts is a, is a really good, you know, example, just because we're used to the idea of a farm being one crop. A farm has a field with one type of plant, and that is our idea of a farm. But that is not how nature works. And so actually, I think a lot of this is about modifying our idea of a farm um, to something that isn't just uh a or B or C and and yeah so and that's what if you speak to indigenous tribes of various types all of them that the, the single thing that is consistent whoever you speak to is they talk about connection they talk about how things are connected and how they are connected to the land and it's just that we have this you know I mean it goes along with we were talking about categories before um but it, there is this sort of Western, that's what Western scientists did, is they went along and categorised things. And that's very useful for understanding the science. But it doesn't mean that you can just put everything in a box and have it in its own separate box. And I think that is part of the, and it's the same, you know, when we were talking about anything to do with climate change, people are like, well, what is the answer? And that's not the that's not the right question. There is no one answer. The answer is we have to look at the little connections and build a system. It's not about building you know, some of this over there and some of this over there and, you know, separating everything. So I think we have to, you know, this, this separa separation and categorization has got the Western world a long, long way. It's got Western science a long way and it's necessary, but it's only necessary as a thinking tool, not as a doing tool. And and that's that's the difference, I think, that we're sort of learning <laughs> behind the times, uh, but we're, we're learning. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. And uh, you're watching uh, Science Shambles Sunday Q&A. Uh, we are here pretty much every Sunday. And uh, just quick mention, if you can support us via Patreon, that is fantastic. Patreon.com slash Cosmic Shambles. It's not just this show. It's loads of other stuff that we're doing, uh, including the Tips for Existence series, which uh, the next episode will be uh, Carolyn Porco talking about uh, some of the incredible uh, photos that she's been involved with, including uh, the famous pale blue dot uh, and the day the Earth smiled uh, photo as well that was uh, more recent and also a new series called uh, A Book You Might Not Know, one of which is going to be uh, this, Les Dawson's A Time for Genesis. Les Dawson's serious novel. It's quite an interesting thing uh, involving many conspiracy theories. So if you can support us by Patreon, that's fantastic. Uh, let's get back to uh, seaweed. Uh, Julia, Liana would like to know, is all seaweed edible or are there poisonous species? And in between, are there just ones that are disgusting? <laughs> Yeah, I have to be careful what I say here because I actually don't like the taste of seaweed and I think there are people like me who don't. And always if I go and do things, people always present me with a box of something or seaweed or seaweed sprinkles or something like that. And so I've got a whole collection of them in my office that I use, but I don't, I try to avoid eating them, you know. But anyway, it, it is a really interesting question because... Um, well, I mean, what, what experience do I have? I was always told by my PhD supervisor that none of the seaweeds were poisonous. So I was on a field trip, this is many, many years ago, and I was teaching the students and they made me a sandwich at lunch and they put Diamantia's tube weed. The, these, we made up all these common names and now I can't remember them. <laughs> you make them up late at night and in the morning you have to check they're okay and there's no, no nothing scurrilous about them. So anyway, I ate this sandwich and it had cheese and it had Dumontier in it. And for 40 minutes afterwards, my mouth was numb. So I don't know whether there's something in the Dumontier that's like a sort of like a nerve thing. But, but the other interesting thing is that there are these Desmarestia species. These are sort of very common subtidally, you know, and, and they, they, 
have um, acid in them. And this is presumably an anti-grazing property and perhaps an anti um, other organisms. So some of the seaweeds get a lot of endophytes living in them, a lot of little seaweeds that grow in them. And this might be another way of protecting themselves from that. But if you put the this desmorestia in with the rest of your seaweeds, it, it wrecks them all because it gives out sulfuric acid. And I was trying to find out what the pH was and, and I can't really get a definitive answer. So I was reading something like pH 0.5, which seems incredible, really. If you think, what are our stomachs? A three. I don't know what tomatoes are very acid, I think. But, but you know, round about those sort of levels. So, you know, I think I'd be a bit wary of eating that. And then there's, a, there's another uh, species group or another genus or genera called Osmundia or Lorentzia. You might know these as pepperdults, which is something that people quite commonly eat. You know, you munch it off the shore. And this gives off these secondary metabolites. So these are things like bromines, things like that. And, you know, if you're working in the lab with some of the species, you have to work under a fume hood because they're kind of toxic. It's like sort of mustard gas or something like that. But again, the, these are anti-grazing. And but, but when you look inside them, some of these species are full of little green filamentous seaweeds. And somehow they have managed to evade these these um, metabolic products in some way. And I think these are very, very interesting relationships. And, you know, we're doing a lot of work um, with the seaweed farmers out in the tropics in, in um, the Philippines and uh, Malaysia and Tanzania. And, you know, one of the things we're interested in is can we start to think about the properties? It's a bit like Helen was saying, linking things up, you know, in some of these seaweeds where uh, you can actually try and deflect some of the sort of problems that some of these um, cultivated crops get. You know, can you help to reduce, say, fish, fish grazing? Can you help to reduce um, uh, diseases and pests and so on? So, you know, the, the, the seaweeds probably wouldn't kill you. You can take calcified ones. They use as vermifuges in some countries. But, um, you know, and I would also be wary of eating them because unless you really know where they're from, because they also have their microflora with them, their microbiome with them. And we've done quite a lot of work on this. And when you look at some of the bacteria that come out, you think, I don't really know if I really want to eat that after all, you know. <laughs> so, so, you know, they're, they're complex organisms like us, like humans, you know, we're, don't, we're not just human. We're all these other bits and pieces. And we're learning a lot more about these relationships in the seaweed. So can you eat them? There are some very good ones to eat, but can't get them from good sources and, um, you know, make sure you know where they're coming from. But, but they probably wouldn't kill you if you ate them. They might not make you very well. <laughs> now, there is a recommendation. They probably wouldn't kill you. <laughs> I don't We're want to be responsible. I don't want to no. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, um, Alex, question for you from uh, Kristen, who would like to know. Uh, she said she read an article by you last year uh, about your uh, desire to uh, decolonize botany at uh, Kew, and uh, would like to just know a little bit more uh, about that. And uh, also, uh, she said particularly around medical use of plants. Right. So, your question, um, and it's a quite complex one as well. So. Um, you know, I work at the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, which has been around for 260 years. So in a sense, um, our mission has always been about um, mapping, understanding plant and our fungal diversity uh, and trying to understand how we can use it sustainably. But in a sense, we've also been intrinsically connected to um, the UK's history and imperial history as well. And, um, you know, there's some really good examples about how uh, traditional knowledge has Come to bear, um, you know, benefits to local communities, and and there are stories where that has not happened. So I think it, it's clear we cannot undo history, uh, but there's a lot we can do today. And I think um, what my colleagues and I we've been talking a lot about um, ways by which we can really increase um, the voices of underrepresented uh, communities, and especially with the Black Lives Movement, um, we had been working on this for a while, but I think it really triggered uh, an interest of. Um, understanding how how has um, botanical exploration in a way contributed to um, you know the inequalities we're seeing today in the world so I think the things in what we can do practically now is really about telling stories um, 
you know, how our societies and how scientists have accumulated knowledge uh, through time. And uh, in particular, the role of local people, how have they contributed to that knowledge? And many times those people are not even mentioned. You look at um, old reports and, and, and um, you know, how scientists went to different parts of the world um, and found new species to science. And, and, uh, and that knowledge uh, that existed before of the local people, the local communities in terms of what they were using uh, those plants for, or, you know, what they called them was very often forgotten or neglected or, you know, people didn't want, want to acknowledge that. So I think there's a there's a piece around uh, reflecting and revising the language we use. Myself, I've, I've advocated um, in that piece, I think, um, should refer to in, in a conversation about decolonizing uh, botany, that I don't think we should be using the word discovery unless we, you know, we really mean a uh, scientific discovery. But I think in many cases, uh, species have been using, have been used uh, by traditional, uh, you know, knowledge by, by people there for many hundreds of, if not thousands of years. Um, and I think we need to distinguish what a scientific description, you know, Western terms means uh, versus uh, a, 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 a true discovery. And I myself, I'm from a colonized country, Brazil. Um, and um, I always learned when I went to, you know, to school that Brazil was discovered in, in 15, um, Oh, oh, and and that's something no one would even question. So I think we absolutely need to change our mindset in referring to the past and how uh, knowledge has been lost in many cases. Uh, and when it comes to this question about medicinal use of plants, um, we have a, a situation now that um, over half of all the medicines uh, used today derive from the beginning from uh, from wild species, and they have been synthesized, and sometimes they're used directly in the medicines. Uh, but the interest and um, uh, investments in discovering new uh, leads and new treatments from medicinal plants has decreased. Uh, that has to do with the legislation that has become harder and harder uh, to, to deal with. But also because um, uh, I think we've really been lacking some good examples of where such uh, uses um, come back to the original community. So I think there are lots of potential when it comes to both medicine, but also food sources New source, new source of fiber, um, you name it. But when there is an economic benefit, it absolutely needs to go back to go back to the communities which have been preserving those species, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of the knowledge come, is coming from them as well. Um, so yeah, I think in terms of language, you know, not, not using the word discovery as much. When you find something, you want to describe it scientifically. I'm sure my mum and my wife would love if I called a new orchid species uh, in their honor. But I think it's better to actually use and, and honor uh, the local knowledge of communities. And we're working at Kiel with many partners, including Natural History Museum um, uh, in London, but also Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh, um, in Germany, Australia, uh, Canada, many different organizations are facing similar challenges. So we're trying to find ways uh, to really um, not undo history, but acknowledge history in a way that we haven't done before. Juliet, do you want to add something to yeah, that? Yeah, can I just come in here? This is this is really, really, um, this is great to hear. It just it's slightly left of this, but, you know, for example, when uh, my colleagues in Hawaii find new seaweeds, and, well, we'd say new, at least they, they just, they're not described, let's say, they always work with the indigenous people and they come up with names that the, that, they agree a name and they use all these wonderful names from the indigenous people and I really think that's a, the fantastic way to go and you know it acknowledges that that knowledge and it, and you know how they've used these species and I think it actually it really enhances what we're trying to do you know it just adds that other dimension to it. Thank you Juliet and thank you Alex and uh, got a quick question that's coming from Dean. I'm going to throw it at you Helen because I think you'll probably know this. Dean says piggybacking on to the talk about Why does honey, a B question, why does honey crystallise after a long time? Oh so um, honey is quite common I think. so it's 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 not just sugar <laughs> um, it's got other things in it and I am not entirely sure what they are but, but the crystallisation is probably I would think because so so the I don't really know the answer to this. I, I suspect it's something to do with the crystallization just taking a long time and depending on temperature. So if you cool things a little bit and they have long enough for the chains for the the, the molecules to line up, then you can form a crystal. Um, I'm not sure. So sometimes you can put things in a mixture which 
makes it harder to crystallize. But I don't know what's in honey that might make it harder to crystallize. Um, so I'm not, I don't know. Um, it will be something to do with how easy it is for the molecules to line up in, in, in an exact um, uh, grid. But I, I'm not sure, and it, it, that's more likely to happen if you cool things down. But there are things that will inhibit crystallization. I don't know what they are. I don't know what the bees are up to. So this is, I think, only the to. second time ever, at least in 10 years, where I thought, I bet Helen knows, and you haven't known. That's, I, I reckon it's still only twice that that's ever happened. <laughs> um, does, does any, and, and no black market. It's, uh, I, I'm, I'm always amazed at the diversity of your knowledge. Um, there, is there, anyone else have any? any uh, Alex, do you know what, about why honey crystallizes? No, I don't know the, the exact answer to that. I mean, we look at um, things like olive oil and, you know, anything solidifies at the same temperature. And honey, if you warm it up, if you put it in a, in a heat bed, um, it will eventually um, become much more fluid. I, um, I think that Helen is, Helen's probably right in terms of, uh, you know, how the, how the crystals work. And it's a complex mixture. I think there's so many different uh, kinds of honey depending on when you harvest it, from which flowers. So it's, it's a pretty complex thing. I'd love to know. Tell you what, though, I will go. I will go away and find out. It's the sort of thing that might make a good column topic. So I might. I might. Remember, so write down remember, that was to ask the question, Robin. And if I yeah, it was a, Dean. A yeah, it, yeah. We'll we'll uh, acknowledge them. Brilliant. And uh, uh, now this is a question for you, Juliet, from Scruffy45. Um, every summer near where I live, the surface of the canals becomes coated in a thick green ooze, which I assume is some sort of algae. Now, I've noticed actually on the canal where, near where I live this year, there's a lot more kind of, uh, I, and I'm not entirely sure what the ooze is, a lot more than, than normal. Uh, mm. Anyway, Scruffy45 says it lasts about a month, then just vanishes. What is this and where does it go? The ducks and swans eat it, uh, but they can't eat that much. Well, actually, without seeing it, it's difficult to say, but you do get um, these, I suppose we might call them, I don't know, I, I'm a bit reluctant to use the word bloom, but I suppose we could say, you know, blooms of algae, and you can get them in um, water that's perhaps got a high level of nutrients and it's warm, and, you know, they, they tend to sort of have these summer summer blooms. You, you see this sort of thing. I'm, I'm not a freshwater specialist, but you certainly see this sort of thing around the coasts as well um and uh you know as things get colder and things die back then I, I guess they disappear but i think you can also get these toxic blooms in some freshwater bodies and these are usually caused by cyanobacteria blue green algae and you know these can be quite dangerous you know you hear of dogs drinking the water and dying or getting very sick or you hear of swimmers getting ill from it but it's difficult difficult to know what it is without really seeing it but you do get green algae in the fresh water related to those that are in the sea and they they can grow very very quickly and produce a lot of biomass i'm not sure that's a very helpful answer i probably need a bit more information but do you know what? it's all a start that's the whole thing yeah. So many whole yeah. things, so many answers. It's great. It's great. The uh, this we've just had a question, another one for you, Juliet. For this is from uh, seven-year-old Paige, hmm. and uh, Paige would like to know how far down can seaweed grow? Can it grow without sun? What if it's right at the bottom? Oh no, this is a really an question. So there are records of seaweeds from really deep down in places off the coast of places like Bermuda. You know, maybe getting on for a hundred meters. Maybe, I'm guessing at 200 meters, I think might be the maximum. When you get down there, there's there's very little light, almost no light, but there must be enough for them to be picking up what we call packets of light, these photons. And oft, often they might live for a very long time, these seaweeds, but you know, when you when you see them on herbarium sheets, they just like look like regular, um, you know, like regular seaweeds, but, but they, they've probably been there a long time. And there's been some very interesting work done on this, as I say, off Bermuda, where they've put down, um, you know, these submarines. But I, I've got another theory here, and and I would love to test it, or love to know someone who'd know how to test it. Is, you know, down in the, the depths where you you, which is amazing, where you do see sea seaweeds because the light does get cut out, and that will depend where you are in the world and what the water's like. If it's murky, it'll get cut out very quickly. You know, if you look in a bay around say a coast in some parts of Britain, you know, the, the, you can't really see very far down, if at all. 
But down in the depths then, you've got all these bioluminescent creatures. And I've just had an I a thought and I wonder, and you know, somebody can shoot me down on this, is there enough light? And what are the wavelengths of the light? And it, it can, is, is, can it be picked up from the bioluminescence? And I would just love to be able to test that, you know? So are they using different sources of light that we don't know about? Or are they just very, very good at capturing the very few photons of light, these packets of light that might be getting down into the depths? Some of them actually have ways of becoming optically very dense, which means, you know, if you become black, you can pick up, pick up more wavelengths of light. So it's a really interesting question. And yes, seaweeds do grow where you think they perhaps ought not to. And, you know, if anybody knows anything about bioluminescence, that's my question. Well, Paige, thank you very much for that question. And that question, and as you can see, it's one that's loads of research ahead. So hopefully you'll be doing some of that research as well um, in the future. Uh, this is a question uh, for Alex from Eunice. Eunice would like to know, is playing music for plants actually a thing or just one of those <laughs> old superstitions? <laughs> um I, I don't think there's any evidence that they would do any, anything else. But I mean, if, 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 if you have a good time and, you know, if you like playing music, uh, I guess your hormone levels will uh, go down quite a bit. I don't think there are any benefits that I'm aware of uh, for the plants. But I think we, we cannot underestimate the, the fact that actually plants, they don't have feelings, but they, they can sense when something's going on around them. And especially when it, you know, when it comes to caterpillars and someone chewing their leaves, there is actually ways that they feel that something is going on there and there's a, a very rapid response. It's, n it's really not my uh, area of confidence uh, here, but I know that there is uh, quite a bit of research in terms of how fast um, those signals can reach other parts of the plant so they can basically shut off some of the nutrition, um, you know, um, giving nutrition to, to that part of the plant affected. When it comes to music, not to my knowledge, I don't know whether Helen or anyone else I think Juliet is about yeah. to sing to well, her plant. Well, I sing to my, well, <laughs> I'm, and I look at my house plant, I'm very proud of it, so I don't know. <laughs> also, there's nothing, you know, lovelier than, yeah. you know, lovelier than yeah. to see someone playing a zither next to a sunflower. If you can play the zither <laughs> and you're near a sunflower, it's a beautiful sight. Um, I'm going to throw another one at you, uh, Alex, because uh, I, I just like this. Kate would just like to know, do you have a favourite plant in queue? I mean, I mean, is, is the one that you really, that point of the year when you see it flower and you and and you just feel some kind of connection? And is there an extra level of delight there? It's a hard one, isn't it? I mean, it's like, you know, choosing among your kids, I think. Um, and um, at Kew, we have the, the world's largest collections of living plants, over 20,000 different species. Uh, and uh, and that's both at Kew Gardens and Wakehurst, what we're calling uh, Kew's Wide Botanic Garden. So it's a lot to choose from. Um, I personally like um, going in the palm houses. I feel a bit more at home. And there's a special plant there, which is really uh, one of my favorites because it's um, I believe it's in the western side of the palm house and it's been there for a long time for a very long time I, I briefly mentioned that earlier today uh, and that's um, the oldest pot plant uh, that, that we know in the world it's um, it's a cycad it's the eastern cape giant cycad, cycad. and arrived to queue um, I believe in 1775 so the whole pot the, the way the plant weighs more than a ton uh, and it's more than four meters in height and it looks a bit like a palm because of the leaves, how they, they come from the same trunk. And then you look at the leaves, they look a bit like a fern, but it's it's none of them. It's not even closely related to other ferns or palms. It's a cycad. It's a very ancient lineage of plants um, that are not related to any of those. So the way it got into Kew is that it was um, it was collected in the wild in, in Eastern Cape, um, which is in South Africa. And then um, it was um, brought back alive, strapped to the deck of a ship. Uh, which sailed all the way from South Africa up the Thames until it reached uh, Kew Gardens. And there used to be a small bridge between um, just the, the Thames path uh, to get into, into Kew. And that journey must have taken several months. So they had it on the deck so we would get some sunlight and some um, rain uh, water as well. So it's a very remarkable example of how long those plants can live there. So, you know, it doesn't matter which time of the year, it could be in the middle of the most terrible winter, you can get into the palm house and you know it's it's both the smells and, and the temperature uh, and also see that plant beautifully living there as if nothing else is going on so it's gone through lots of wars and all kinds of different crises and it's just been there growing very slowly a couple of centimeters per year perhaps um, and it's an amazing thing and it's 
on top of that, it's, it's, it's a threatened um, species. It's a vulnerable species. And many cycads are actually really, really in danger because people have been over half at harvesting them. So it's, it's, up, it's got a lot to tell uh, if we're able to listen. That's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, question for you, Juliet, which is from Barat, who would like to know, sometimes you see big masses of seaweed on the mm. ocean surface. Is this lots of different plants tangled together or one massive organism? Interesting question. And the first thing is to say that it's not one massive organism. It'll be lots of lots of individuals. But there's there's a, at least a couple of things going on here. So you 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 will see seaweed floating on the surface. You'll see it when you know when you go swimming and you get all this stuff around your legs when you go into the water. So you do get rafts of seaweed that's perhaps um, broken off with age or from storms and that will be brought into the shore and that will form your strand lines which are very important perhaps for capturing sand to make sand dunes or for food for birds. Sometimes they rot and there'll be anaerobic digestion with bacteria so that will give off unpleasant hydrogen sulfide um, smells and if they if you get these these huge blooms like there was one off Brittany some years ago with massive blooms of this stuff that get washed up and rot it can can kill it killed a horse I don't know if it killed the rider as well but it's certainly can, it's toxic but the other thing that 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 occurs in the sea naturally that there are these seaweeds which live floating there are some green ones a bit like perhaps in the in the fresh water we talked about but also you get these brown ones these sargassums particularly and you know that they, they 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 float around in these big masses and that's how they they live but what's happening now is that with climate change it's shifting the patterns of the oceans and these um rafts are being washed up on the shores of you know places like the caribbean we're working with a group now i have a project with mexicans where they have this as a major problem but this is a really interesting problem because not only do you get these huge piles of um, seaweeds, which they call golden tides, which is a very nice way of explaining something that's really quite quite a major problem, but it's also affecting the the subtidal or shallow communities because it's so so abundant that it's sort of destroying some of the native indigenous species in the subtidal, and they're being washed up. So what we're trying to do is we have we have another citizen science based on the big seaweed search, working with the Mexicans on this. And we're trying to sort of see if we can get an indirect answer to what what's the effect of these these huge rafts of seaweeds on on these um, on these other communities. And we're also trying to see if we can use this sort of citizen science approach to to work with the people, perhaps to try to empower them to work with these sort of problems. It's a really, really interesting project. But yes, there are these rafting seaweeds. No, they're not all the same individual. They may well be clonal, although that's a difficult thing to talk about in seaweeds because it's a lot of genetic exchange. Um, but but uh, but I hope that sort of gives you an indication of, of what's going on. Well, Thank perhaps you something very else much. to add about those seaweed rafts, just quickly, is that other animals live near mm. them. So the seaweed can just almost it can be a shelter it's got hiding places in it it's a bit of shade from the sun and, and so actually that the rafts although they may be made of one species of seaweed perhaps they are they're all, it's almost like an upside down island mm. that underneath that's you get a lot of life that drifts around with the raft so so it has lots of species even if they're not just seaweed species thank that's, you go on julia absolutely true they are a habitat in their own right and uh, incredibly important and you know these these effects that we're we're having a, a you know sort of another issue in a sense but but all these things are incredibly important habitats just as the kelps that are that are fixed are yeah thank you we've got Thank you. We've got time for just one more question just for that. Just to remind you that next week's panel uh, is going to be uh, about COVID. And also, if you go to CosmicShambles.com, you'll find uh, all of the different uh, programmes that, that we made, uh, really starting in about March uh, 2020, uh, about COVID. And uh, it's quite interesting to watch the kind of changing understanding over that time, as well as, in fact, you can find um, all of the old episodes of this and pretty much everything else we've made. Uh, if you can support us for our Patreon, that is fantastic. Patreon.com slash CosmicShambles. I said we've got loads 
loads of new series um, coming up. And uh, also mention, as I said at the beginning, the importance of being interested. My new book is out on the 7th of October. I'll be going off to 100 bookshops. The book includes appearances from uh, Helen. Uh, she pops up in it. And uh, also Jane Goodall, uh, Faye Dowker, Helen Sharman, and uh, and lots of others. Um, and now the final question is a book question. Uh, this is from Ellen. Helen. Uh, did you ever find your seaweed cookbook that you keep promising to show us? Oh. <laughs> I presume um, you I didn't take it, it to the Azores if you had I got didn't it. Bring it. Yes, <laughs> and it's Carrie O'Connor is the author and it's a little book, but I will. So um, the thing about seaweed, so I actually agree with Juliet that I, I have tried eating seaweed and I haven't always liked it. And I keep thinking I should try more because it, it is often in the UK at least, the people now who harvest it do try to do it sustainably. So they're careful. They only, they only harvest by hand, you know, so, so I feel that I should at least try it. And as, as a, someone who's, you know, lifelong vegetarian, mostly vegan, I, I, I do feel I should at least try the seaweeds. Um, they are very strongly flavored, I would say. So the sprinkles I, I have used for flavoring soups um, and I keep, I have to come back. So I haven't found my seaweed cookbook yet, but um, I will next, when I'm back in the UK, um, I will find it. Um, but I, I feel I should try, so I should commit to trying to, I do, I do, I, should, I did actually buy a seaweed cookbook a few weeks ago, a proper, you know, a modern one. Um, and uh, I should try a few more things from that, but I'm a bit, I'm a bit nervous, but I should make myself try. But like Juliet, Juliet said, I think it's an acquired taste. Oh, well, because, maybe you know, we'll try when we, Acquire. When we do Acquire. when we do the Christmas shows at King's Place, maybe we'll see if we can get George Egg to come along as well and do a little bit of cooking oh, with that, yeah, that, that book. That would be fun. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, Helen, from the Azores. Thank you very much to our producer, Trent Burton. Thank you very much for all of your questions. Uh, thanks very much to uh, Alex for joining us. Uh, Alex, where's the best place to go for? Is it just the, the Kew Gardens website or is there somewhere else where people can just find out kind of more information about what? Well, q.org, that's the website where we have all the information. It would be great to, to have people both visiting our website, but also coming to visit us in real life. Well, I know I'm playing the Q bookshops, the Q bookshops. So I'll try and get there early so I can pop over and go to Q Gardens as well. Uh, Juliet, thank you so much for joining us. As we mentioned before, the uh, Citizen Science Project, uh, Big Seaweed Search. If you just go to bigseaweedsearch.org. Is there anywhere else people should go to find out more things about your work, Juliet? Um, well, if they just type in Juliet Brody seaweeds, lots of stuff tends to come up, <laughs> hopefully. And there's the web, but there's, there's quite a lot of stuff. And there's some very nice films that we did in connection with making the, the big seaweed panels in the main hall. So that, that that's very nice, too, to have a look at, too, to have a look at. That's fantastic. Uh, I hope you all enjoy your Sunday and enjoy the rest of uh, uh, the week that is coming up. And uh, with luck, we will see you next Sunday at 10 a.m. or possibly beforehand on one of our other shows. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you.